How We Entered World War I by Barbara Tuckman. On April 2nd, 1917, the United States, as a new contender, entered the tournament of world power from which we have not since, despite wishful attempts, been able to withdraw. Up to then, notwithstanding our hearty belligerence in the Spanish-American War, we were not regarded as one of the great powers, either by them or, on the whole, by ourselves. American participation in the Great War was the beginning of our majority in world affairs. In the half century that has since elapsed, a fundamental shift of the international balance has taken place with the sites of power spreading outward from Europe to the periphery. The governing seat vacated by the collapse of Britain has been taken, not without kicking and protesting against our fate, by this country. On the outbreak of war in 1914, the prevailing American attitude was one of self-congratulation that it was none of our affair, and there was a fixed contention that it should not become so. In classic summary, appropriately from a small town in the heart of the Midwest, the plain dealer of Wabash, Indiana stated, we never appreciated so keenly as now the foresight of our fathers in immigrating from Europe. Newspaper cartoons habitually depicted Uncle Sam separated by a large body of water from a far-off, fiercely squabbling group of little figures. In one case, reminding himself that the chance of his life was to sit tight, keep his hands in his pocket and his mouth shut. In another case, standing shoulder to shoulder with President Wilson with the backs firmly turned on Europe's gore-dripping barbarians. Page two. The belief in our isolation was reinforced by Wilson, who, bent on pursuing the new freedom through domestic reform, was irritated by the threatened interference with this program from overseas his program from overseas. He declared in December 1914 that the country should not let itself be thrown off balance by a war with which we have nothing to do, whose causes cannot touch us. The familiar ring can be traced to a more famous echo 25 years later in Neville Chamberlain's reference to Czechoslovakia as a faraway country of which we know nothing. For Wilson, it was justifiable in August 1914 to ask the American people to be impartial in thought as well as in action, neutral in fact as well as name. But by December, when the expectation of a short war had vanished at the Marne and the armies were locked in the deadly stalemate of the trenches, the war was already touching us forced to recognize that American business could not be held immobile, Wilson had already, in October, reversed his earlier ban on loans to belligerents. This was the foundation for the economic tie, which thereafter, in ever-increasing strength and volume, attached the United States to the Allies. By permitting extension of commercial credit it enabled the Allies to buy supplies in America from which the Central Powers, by virtue of Allied control of the seas, were largely cut off. It opened an explosive expansion in American manufacture, trade, and foreign investments and bent the national economy to the same side in the war as prevailing popular sentiment. For the country on the whole was a pro-ally in sympathy as it was anti-belligerent in wish. The president shared the sentiment. I found him, wrote Colonel House after the first month of war, as unsympathetic with the German attitude as is the balance of the country. Counselor von, Counselor von Haniel of the German embassy in Washington, trying to disabuse his principles of certain illusions, reminded them that American feeling was the outgrowth of a natural connection with England, 
in history, blood, speech, society, finance, culture, and that in the present case, commercial instinct and sentiment point in the same direction. He had hit upon the essence of the situation. Page three. At the same time as he lifted the ban on loans, Wilson agreed to permit unrestricted trade in munitions, contrary to an earlier proposal for their embargo. The two measures were not taken in the Allied interest, although there were to work to the Allies' advantage. But in the American interest, for the administration, no less than von Haniel, knew the strength of the country's commercial instinct and feared that an embargo would turn allied orders to Canada, Australia, and Argentina. To ban loans and embargo munitions would have been to give realistic expression to the isolation that the people and their president believed they enjoyed. But it would have closed off the wealth of unlimited orders, and Americans did not wish to suffer for their neutrality. Rather, they hoped to make a good thing of it. With these two economic measures taken before the war was three months old, the fact, if not the illusion, of isolation was dead. The sinking in May 1915 of the Kernert Lines Lusitania, which carried in addition to a full complement of non-combatant passengers, a part cargo of small arms, ammunition, besides enhancing German fright frightfulness, had brought to a head the issue of submarine warfare. Regarded by the Germans as a munitions carrier using its non-combatant status as protection, the ship was sunk without warning. That is, without ordering passengers off in lifeboats before losing their torpedo. Of the nearly 2,000 persons aboard, 1,195 were lost, including 124 Americans. In the previous week, two, Ameri in the previous week, two American ships had been attacked with two American deaths. Thus, the rights of both neutrals and non-combatants were at stake. Tense and protracted negotiations followed in which Wilson's almost impossible task was to force Germany to acknowledge these rights without the ultimate threat of war, which was the last thing he wanted. He had to pick his way along a narrow ridge between the precipice of war on one side and that of abdication of neutral rights as advocated by his Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, on the other. Representing the pacifist position that no interest was worth defending at the risk of war, Bryan became spokesman of the demand that Americans be warned not to, or as some insisted, forbidden to, travel on belligerent ships. In this demand was crystallized a central issue that transcended the matter of American trade or neutral rights. The real issue was our position as a great power. The United States could not allow the U-boats to keep her nationals off the sea lanes without forfeiting the respect of other nations, the confidence of her own citizens, and her prestige before the world. She could not forbid her own people to exercise their rights, Wilson wrote to Senator Stone, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and a leading isolationist, without conceding her own impotence as a nation. This was the crux, the more so as to concede impotence now would undercut the ambition which the president already had in mind to mediate the war and save the war from its own wickedness. Page four. In the spring of 1916, debate raged in Congress and country over the Army Bill. Progressives thundered against militarism as the spawn of capitalist greed and the destroyer of the American dream. Interventionists insisted America must join in the battle of the democracies against tyranny, a cause embarrassed by the inconvenient alliance of the Tsar 
if political freedom was to survive anywhere. Preparedness parades grew louder and louder, a mammoth example on Fifth Avenue lasting 12 hours with 125,000 civilian men and women marchers, 200 brass bands, and 50 drum corps, thousands of cheering observers on the sidewalks, and floodlights on the last squadrons as they marched on into the night. Impervious, a majority of Republican representatives in the House voted to warn American citizens off armed merchant ships, indicating their firm preference for discretion over neutral rights. The final four months leading up to U.S. belligerency began with Wilson's concerted effort through December and January to end the war through mediation. His concept of a peace without victory, although called by Senator La Follette the greatest message of the century, did not appeal to the belligerents. Since neither side wanted the American president to arrange the terms of a settlement and each was bent on total victory, Wilson's attempt to negotiate a peace failed. In the meantime, Germany, having built up a fleet of 200 submarines, took the decision to risk American hostility for the sake of an all-out effort to end the war her way. On January 31st, 1917, she formally notified Washington of intent to resume unrestricted submarine warfare beginning the next day. All neutral ships would be forcibly prevented from reaching England. In the vortex of the conflict, America had become, willing or not, a major power as Arsenal and Bank of the Allies, to whose cause our economy, no less our political system, was now attached. And as obstacle, so long as we continued to supply the Allies to any German hope of victory. To yield freedom of the seas now, after two years' hard-fought maintenance of the principle, was incompatible with first-class status. Wilson was left with no choice but to declare the long-avoided rupture of relations. At once, pacifist groups were roused to feverish action in mass meetings to demand that American ships stay out of war zones, while interventionists agitated equally loudly for the arming of our ships and the aggressive assertion of American rights. Page 5. As ships piled up in home ports, American commerce threatened to come to a standstill affecting the entire national economy. The cabinet grew seriously alarmed. Although Wilson possessed the executive authority to arm ships, he was reluctant to take the step that would inevitably start the shooting. He preferred to ask Congress for authorization, thus touching off the great debate and filibuster on the armed ship bill. In the midst of it came the revelation of the telegram from German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman inviting Mexico into alliance as a belligerent. As a scheme to keep U.S. forces occupied on their own border, it offered to help Mexico regain her lost territories of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico intercepted and decoded by British naval intelligence and made available to this country, the telegram was released to the press on March 1st in the hope of influencing the little band of Wilfelman in the Senate. It failed of that purpose, but aroused the American public more than anything since the outbreak of war. As a proposed assault on U.S. territory, it convinced Americans of German hostility to this country. On March 9th, Congress adjourned without passing the bill. The president issued the order for arming ships anyway and waited for the overt act. It came on March 18th in the torpedo wing without warning of three American merchant ships with heavy loss of life. Conveniently at this moment, the overthrow of the Tsar by the preliminary revolution in Russia 
purified the allied cause and the advent of the great new convert to democracy under the Kerensky regime brought a glow of enthusiasm to liberal hearts. At the same time, the relentless mounting toll of the submarine was making a graveyard of the Atlantic and raising a serious prospect of the Allies' defeat. Page 6. For two more weeks, the president hesitated in his agony, afflicted by his sense, as he had said earlier that month, month that matters outside our life as a nation and over which we had no control, despite our wish to keep free of them, were drawing the country into a war it did not want. If any nation now neutral should be drawn in, he had said in November, it would know only that it was drawn in by some force it could not resist. This is as just a statement of the truth as any. We were not artificially maneuvered to a fate that might have been otherwise. What engulfed us were the realities of world conflict. On April 2nd, Wilson went to Congress to ask for its formal acceptance of the status of belligerent that had been thrust upon us. He put the blame specifically on submarine warfare, a war against all nations. He said, neutrality is no longer feasible or desirable when the peace of the world and freedom of its people are menaced by the existence of autocratic governments backed by a force which is controlled wholly by their will, not by the will of the people. The validity of this proposition was somewhat weakened by the fact that he had believed neutrality feasibly and eminently desirable in coexistence with these same nations for three years. A steadfast pace, he now discovered, can never be maintained except by a partnership of democratic nations. Citing the Zimmerman telegram as evidence of hostile purpose, he said there could be no assured security for the democracies in the presence of Prussian autocracy, this natural foe of liberty. And so, to the final peroration, the world must be made safe for democracy. The right is more precious than peace. Nothing that Wilson said about the danger to democracy could have been said all along. For that cause, we could have gone to war six months or a year or two earlier with incalculable effort, effect on history. Except for the proof of hostility in the resumed submarine campaign and the Zimmerman telegram, our cause would have been as valid. But we would have then been fighting a preventative war, a prevent a victory by German militarism with this potential danger to our way of life, not a war of no choice. Instead, we waited for the overt acts of hostility which brought the war to us. In April 1917, the illusion of isolation was destroyed. America came to the end of innocence and the exuberant freedom of bachelor independence that the responsibility of world power have not made us happier is no surprise. To help ourselves manage them, we have replaced the illusion of isolation with a new illusion of omnipotence. That screen, too, must fall.